Hey there! Today I'm going to do a quick video about my new Wi-Fi button. As the name suggests, it's a small box with buttons that, when you press them, connect to Wi-Fi and turn on or off the lights in my house. They are smart lights. I want to talk a little bit about some of the features of the button, and the first feature is the fact that there are just buttons. There are no ports or any charging or power situation on this box. It's entirely self-contained. What's more, it will last for not just a couple of days or a couple of weeks, but months to years on a single battery charge. The back does come off, you can get in here and look at the battery, but I should need to charge it very, very rarely. And that's kind of a feature. This box is designed to sit under my coffee table or next to my bed and control my lights or my projector with an upcoming build to infrared signals. And so I want to have it so I can just set and forget, not run power cables, not have to recharge every week, just pop it down, maybe put some tape to secure it there and just replace the battery once every six months or so. How have I done that? Well, what's happening inside here is there's a small microcontroller, in this case an ESP32, that goes into deep sleep. The controller is technically still running all the time as I'm holding this or it's sitting on the side, but it's drawing a tiny, tiny amount of current. And I'm talking in the microamps. And all that tiny part of the chip that's left on is doing is waiting for a button press. As soon as it sees a button press, it wakes up the rest of the chip and gets to work. It connects to my Wi-Fi, talks to my lights, sends the right signal to turn them on or off, and then sleeps again. And that's the reason it can last for so long. So I'm going to open up the button, show you some of the internals. It's not particularly complicated in there. And then show you a little bit of the code just so you get an idea of how to do this sort of build yourself. So let's start by taking off the back and having a look inside. The box here is just two pieces of 3D printed plastic and they snap together at the back here. Quick rotation and it comes right off. Having a look inside, you can see there's an ESP32 on a Adafruit feather and a small lithium ion battery at the top here. Let's pull those out. I'll just pull off all the cables and we'll have a look at the parts separated out. So here you can see the four basic components of the Wi-Fi button. The lithium-ion battery, the microprocessor board, the proto board with some wiring and some resistors, and the box and buttons themselves. Let's start by looking at the microprocessor board. This is an ESP32 microcontroller mounted onto an Adafruit feather board, which you can see here. Adafruit boards all have one nice feature. They have this lithium-ion battery connector and a battery recharge circuit. What that means is I can just take my battery here, plug it into the tiny little connector, and away I go, I've got power. Even better, this board can recharge the batteries. Just plug in a micro USB cable up here, and it will recharge the battery while also powering the device at the same time. This means that when I do have to recharge the battery every so often, I can just take the device, open the back up, plug a cable in here and leave it for a day or so, and then unplug it and continue. The other board here is this Proto board, which is also sold by Adafruit and stacks nicely with their feathers. This board is mostly wiring to bring the various pins I'm using on the main board down to one central place. The buttons use four pins each. There's two pins for the actual button itself. Those four pins are nearly all drawn directly from the main pins that go up to the main board here, but there are these two resistors. These resistors are pull-down resistors, their job is to keep the sensor pins on the main board at ground, even when the device is turned off. Without a pull down resistor, the value of the pin will float. It's not anchored to any part of the circuit when the button is open, so it actually randomly jumps between zero and one. We don't want that, so we have these resistors there to keep it down. The ESP does have built in internal pull down resistors that you can use, but when you use deep sleep mode like we are here, those don't work, and so a small board with a couple of 100,000 ohm resistors like we have here does the job nicely. There's a couple of small details here. These wires that soldered onto the buttons are actually just normal header cable. I put a little bit of heat shrink around the ends here to keep them together. And the 3D printed box is pretty simple, but there is a little ridge here. That ridge holds the battery in place so it doesn't wobble around inside. To close it up, just put it all in there, shove it in in a mostly graceful fashion, and twist the back back on. Now you've seen the insides, let's take a quick look at the code. 
So here we have the code for the wirefair button. Now to start off, let's have a look at the very bottom of the file because that's where the sort of interesting twist here is. Right down here we see that the loop function is never called. Now if you've done Arduino development before, you know that there's a simple layout, as we see here with Blink. Setup is called when the device powers on, and then loop is called repeatedly again and again as long as the device is running. But of course, what we're doing is building a device that turns itself on, runs some code, and turns itself off. And so all of our code is in setup. Loop literally is never called. Let's go through the flow of setup now. To start off, the very start of setup actually reads the various button pins we have set up for the buttons. This is because there's a very small delay between pressing the button and the device coming out of sleep and going into our code. So you want to read those button states as soon as possible, so when somebody can't press the button and release it, thus waking the device up, but still releasing the button before we have time to read the state. But we do that first, and then if we've read a state, it's one of these button pins, we store which button it was, number one or number two, and the pin of the LED we need to light up. And then down here, we can simply light up the right LED as we start going through the rest of the function. There is some serial stuff in here for debugging. It doesn't actually make the device function, of course, but if you're like me, trying to figure out how to make your lights work over their weird XML RPC API, it's useful to have some serial debugging in here for that kind of thing. But we open the serial port. We turn on the built-in LED for a bit more debugging if you need to do that stuff to make sure we definitely booted. And then we go through the Wi-Fi process. So crucially, if we actually have a button turned on, if that code at the top triggered, we go in here. If that button wasn't actually triggered and we woke up for no reason, either the button was pressed too quickly or, as is the most common case, the device was literally powered on for the first time, you have to turn it on initially for it to sleep the first time. We just say, hey, we're not doing anything, and sleep straight away. And down here you can see that sleep code. All we do is call the ESP sleep enable ext1 wake up. We pass it th this bit mask, which if you look at the top here, is set to this binary value of two to the power of 32, ordered with two to the power of 33. That tells the ESP we want to wake up when either of the GPIO pins 32 or 33 is basically receives a high value. And then once we've set the wake up, we just call deep sleep start. Once you call this function, anything after it in the Arduino code will never run. This is basically the end of the program. If we have got a button pressed, before we do that, we go here and we boot up our Wi-Fi. Because we're literally booting the device fresh every time, it has to get to Wi-Fi every time. And this does cause a little bit of lag. That's about one or two seconds for the device to connect to the network, do its DHCP handshake, get an IP address and connect. And this little loop here starts up the Wi-Fi and waits for the background processing of the ESP chip to do its Wi-Fi handshake and get an IP address. Once we've got that, we come down here into the actual code that controls my lights. Now, I have Belkin Wemo lights. They're very convenient because they have a Wi-Fi chip built into them and each light has its own IP address and each light has its own XML RPC API. And so what we can do is just talk to the light and work out what state it's in and then toggle it to the other state. And that's what this code does. There's a couple of helper functions here. I'll show you those in a second. But this one talks to the light and works out what its current state is. Is it on or off? And the complexity here is that the lights can be listening on one of two ports. And so we have to test each port to figure out which one it is. So this code both gets the state and tries to figure out if it's the first port number or the second port number. Once it's figured that out, it then goes down here and then sets the state to the inverse of the previous state. Now, there is a case where there's a couple of errors. For example, here, we have an error if we couldn't read the state from either port. And here, we have an error if we just couldn't set the state for the light switch after we've read it initially. This little error flash function here just flashes the button you've pressed the number of times you pass in very rapidly, so five or seven times, so you can get some visual feedback saying, oh, this failed. The most common failure would be that the light switch isn't available, in which case it will fail up here, and you just get this five flash down here. These functions are defined a bit lower in the file. Here's error flash. It's just a single loop that turns the LED pins on and off very rapidly with a 100 millisecond delay each time. 
And then down here we have the slightly large and gargantuan functions for getting and retrieving switch states. Because the switches have an XML RPC API, they take things like this. You do a HTTP request with XML in it and certain things like a SOAP action header and there's UPnP URLs. I cribbed all of this off of a previous guide to how these switches work, just basically replicating it exactly as it was, getting the headers correct, and just making sure it worked in testing. This function has most of the niceness of the XML on it, and then set switch state here and get switch state here, both call that function with different variables. To get the state, we say, hey, I want to get binary state, and to set it, we say, I want to set binary state, and I want to pass the state here. Overall, it's only about 200 lines of code. And if you have a simpler device than a Belkin switch, for example, you're just literally ping a webhook on if this, then that, then you can replace all of this code with a single call to HTTP client in this section here and knock a good 100 lines out of the file. You can also do different handling for different buttons. My future plan is to have one button control lights and the second button control the projector via an IR emitter that is controlled by if this then that, but I haven't yet built the IR emitter, so you'll see that in future. And a brief note on wiring. You can see here at the top of the file, we've defined our two button pins to detect buttons on and our two LED pins to flash the LEDs on. Now, if you see here on this wiring diagram, this is what it looks like for one of the buttons. The button's LED, the plus and minus down here, are wired to the ground on one side and the LED pin on the other. And the common and normally open part of the button, that is the part that will close when you push the button, is wired to the three volt line here and then via a pull down resistor to ground. The pull down resistor will keep pin 27 at ground as long as the device is sleeping. When the button is depressed, the resistor will lose out to the direct connection to three volts and we'll get a nice high signal to wake up the device. The final device has two of these circuits, obviously sharing a few common lines, and that's what you saw on the proto board in the previous section. The pins I chose to use are just the four along the top here, 27, 33, 15, 32. You can, of course, use any GPIO pins. In fact, you could have multiple buttons. I'm pretty sure you could get probably six or seven buttons on the number of pins this device has, but I only had space for two in my box. So that's the Wi-Fi button. It's a small build with a lot of flexible options. You know, this particular example has a 3D printed case. It has the nice shiny buttons that have light up LEDs in them, but you could easily swap out many or all of the components for cheaper versions. You could have a basic wooden case or a cheap plastic one you've recycled elsewhere. You could have buttons without lights. You can find a cheaper version of the ESP32 that doesn't have battery recharging, just shove some AA batteries in there. Or you could get fancier, have a nice metal case, with aluminium and even nicer buttons. If you want to build your own or you want some more details about how it works, there's some details below in the video description to the code and a few other write-ups and diagrams I have from the building of this. I'll probably build a few more of the buttons and of course there are the other projects the buttons are designed to talk to and interact with, but those are for future videos. Until then, see you next time. Thank you.